Welcome dear students to the International Economic Groupings course and the topic of informal groupings, the G7 and G20. This is Dr. Dina Mohi. Let's begin our lecture. The purpose of this lecture is to discuss informal economic groupings as one of the important features of international economic cooperation. In this respect, G7 and G20 are going to be discussed. As we discussed at the beginning of this course, there are many features of international economic cooperation that have proliferated since the end of the Second World War. First, the rise of formal international institutions, which represents a key feature of international economic cooperation. With respect to international monetary and financial arrangements, one can find the IMF and the World Bank, or the so-called Bretton Woods institutions. Also, an example of key formal international institutions is the WTO, which is responsible for multilateral trading cooperation among countries. A second important feature is the rise of regionalism, whereby countries with common attributes in areas such as history, geography, and stage of development cooperate together to move towards trade liberalization. The proliferation of informal economic groupings is another important feature. An example is the G7, which was created to reflect the dissatisfaction of industrialized countries with some inefficiencies of the decision-making of formal institutions and their inability to tackle new important issues. Now, let's turn to the G7. In order to discuss this topic, we first need to understand what is the G7 and when it was created. The G7 is an informal group of countries that was created in 1975. It consists of seven major developed countries, which collectively represents about 10% of the world's population and about 50% of the world's GDP in nominal terms. This group comprises USA, France, UK, Germany, Italy, Japan, and Canada. Russia became a member of the G7 when it joined in 1998 to form the G8, but the group returned back to G7 by the suspension of Russia's membership in 2014. This group meets together each year to discuss issues such as climate change, energy policies, security, trade, and global economic governance. Now, it is easy to imagine the weight of these countries in terms of their economic, political, and military power, and their influence on the global economy. Also, these countries have a considerable influence on policies of multilateral organizations such as the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and the World Trade Organization. Okay, now what are the reasons that led to the creation of the G7? Well, the G7 was created in response to the collapse of the Bretton Woods system. As we know, this system was initiated in 1944, when developed countries agreed to use the US dollars as a key currency in conducting their foreign transactions and to tie their currencies to the US dollar. At this time, USA was committed to convert the US dollar into gold at a rate of $35 per ounce. But this system was clearly unsustainable. Over the years, USA started to print dollars with massive amounts which led to its inability to convert dollars into gold. In 1971, President Nixon announced the suspension of the convertibility of dollars into gold in what was known at that time by the Nixon shock. This procedure led to the collapse of the international monetary system. Okay, let's turn to another important reason for the creation of the G7, which is the first oil shock. In 1973, the OPEC organization imposed an oil embargo targeted at countries supporting Israel. This procedure led to a massive increase in oil prices, which sparked stagflation in many countries. Now there are some questions that need to be answered. Is there any membership criteria that the country needs to fulfill in order to join the G7 and what is the structure of this group? In order to answer these questions, we first need to review 
how these countries formed the group. The finance ministers of USA, Germany, France, UK started to meet in the White House Library in April 1973 to discuss issues related to the global economic order. Then these meetings have evolved to an annual ministerial meeting and summits of leaders of these countries. The first summit was held in France in 1975 with the inclusion of Italy and Japan forming the G6. Then, in 1976, Canada joined this group to form the G7. Then, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, Russia became a member of the G7 in 1998, and since then, this group has been known as the G8. However, members of the G8 were cautious about coordinating their economic policies with Russia because of its excessive use of IMF financing and huge public debt, which makes Russia the, does not, uh, is not similar to uh, the wealthy club of the G7. Russia's membership was fully suspended in March 2014 due to its annexation of Crimea. In 2018, President Donald Trump called for the readmission of Russia to the group, but his suggestion was rejected. Also, it is worth mentioning that the EU, represented by the presidents of the European Council, has fully participated in the G7 since 1981 as a non-numerated member of the G7. In addition, the IMF also participates in finance meetings. Therefore, one can find that there is no specific criteria for the membership in the G7. Also, being an informal group, not a formal organization, the G7 has no formal organizational structure. Its, its presidency rotates among its member countries. The president country sets the agenda of the summit each year and can invite certain countries or international organizations to the summit. Now, what are the, the, the role and mission of this, uh, of this group? There are three main objectives of the G7, which, which are macroeconomic policy coordination, either in response to global shocks or to reduce huge external imbalances among the members of this group. Another objective is to promote an open rule-based multilateral trading system and to facilitate this system. The, uh, to facilitate the working of this system. And finally, promoting financial stability through common regulatory standards and common inst institutions to enhance global economic governance. These, these uh, overriding objectives is in addition to many issues that they discuss in their, in their meetings. They discuss, uh, discuss issues such as energy policies and climate change, security issues, agriculture, and so on. Now, let's turn to the criticism to the G7 and the rise of the G20. But first, we need to know that the G7 has played an important role in the global economy, and according to its own standards, it had a history of success. The group has played an important role in shaping and stabilizing the international monetary system after its collapse in 1971 through the consultations it provided. Also, it had a key role in the conclusion of the Uruguay Round and the creation of the WTO. However, now there are, there are claims that the group is no longer as influential as it used to be. One of the major criticisms against the G7 is that it, claim, it's claimed, it is claimed 
that it serves the national interests of its, of its member countries as it provides in many cases national financial reform agenda, not a reform for the global financial system as it claims to be its role. Another important criticism is with respect to its representation and legitimacy as a central player in the global economic governance. With the collective GDP of its members, member states accounting for about 50% of the world's GDP, the, G7's, the G7 accounts only for about 10% of the world's population. This makes it unrepresentative of the whole world economy. In addition, major emerging powers such as China, India, Brazil, and South Korea are missing from the group. However, the, the group refuses the inclusion of these countries because this would no longer be a forum of like-minded nations which would make it difficult to reach consensus. With respect to legitimacy, the problem is not associated with uh, its right to exist but it is mainly about the way the G7 used to promote itself as a platform responsible for the global economic governance, not the interests of a small group of countries. Hence, the G7 is heavily criticized as being a wealthy club whose main interest is to maintain global and economic stability that only help accumulate more wealth to its member countries. Another important issue is the deepening divisions that arose since the U.S. presidential elections won by, won by Donald Trump. Donald Trump's policies contradict with the views of the group, and now Trump has replaced Russia as a primary source of G7 tension, which displays the weakness and disunity of its members and undermines the group's mission to resolve global issues. Now, let's move to the rising role of the G20. Some economists argue that without China and other emerging market economies, such as Brazil, India, South Africa, and Mexico, the, the group lacks relevance and needs to be replaced with, with a more representative group of countries. In this context, in 1999, a forum for finance ministers and central bank governance, governors from 19 countries plus the EU formed the G20, which is considered a forum of global economic coordination. With the inclusion of major emerging powers such as China, Brazil, Mexico, South Africa, India, and Russia, the, G7, the G20 is more representative. The collective GDP of these states accounts for about 80% of the world's GDP, and the group represents two-thirds of the world's population. It is also important to note that many observers note that the G20 was most effective during the global financial crisis. It provided large liquidity that limited the contagion of the banking crisis. It kept markets open and provided the stimulus packages to restore growth. However, some criticism has been introduced to the group recently because it's of its inability to resolve problems of rising protectionism and disagreement about climate change and migration policies uh, and issues that arise recently from, the Donald, from Donald Trump's uh, procedures towards trade protectionism and uh, climate change issues, and with respect to the Brexit of the uh, uh, of Britain from the EU. Thank you for listening, and see you in next lectures.